You know I've traveled near and far To see the shining sea I've seen a lot of places And people that were nice to me One place that's in my heart And this is how I feel I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville She's nestled in the sand hills on a river called Cake Field. Special to so many who proudly served our country here. She was named for Lafayette and known for cotton mills. I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville. My hometown, Fayetteville I'm so proud to be from here It don't take long when you're away from home To find out how you feel It's always good to come home to Fayetteville Babe Ruth hit his first one yeah. Heard around the world Sherman marched with the Union And burned the arsenal Old Market House still standing But stands for freedom's will I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville Take long when you're away from home To find out how you feel It's always good to come home to Fayetteville My all-American city, Fayetteville Talking about my hometown Fayetteville We're going to call the September 26, 2011 Federal City Council meeting to order. Thank everyone for being here tonight. 
We ask that you stand for invocation led tonight by Reverend Dr. James Randall from McPherson Presbyterian Church on Cliffdale Road. And then if you'd remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Please join with me as we bow our heads to our Lord God. Almighty God, we thank you for the men and women who have volunteered and have committed their lives to serving in Fayetteville City Council. We ask for your blessings upon them tonight, and we pray that they would all serve in their offices with integrity, with an eye to love and compassion for this great city of Fayetteville, North Carolina. We pray that uh, they will always do justice, love compassion, and remember to walk humbly with our God. We pray that righteousness will be present in their dealings each and every day, as they remember that righteousness exalts a nation and a city, and sin is a disgrace to any people. And Heavenly Father, we pray tonight that those who have been elected to these offices of great prestige and honor, remember that they are servants of the people of the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina. And we pray that they will lead us into the future as they do remember that they are your servants and those of this people. We pray these things, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate you being with us tonight. Okay, we'll move first to item number four, which is approval of tonight's agenda. Okay, Mr. Moan, uh, seconded by Mr. Bates. Any discussion on that? Hearing none, let me ask for your vote, please. That's unanimous. We'll move now to items in recognition, and uh, Councilmember Arp is going to help us with this one tonight. Mr. Arp. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the following folks. I'd ask that you stand when I call your names out. Ms. Sandra Mitchell, Ms. Pauline Hart, Sergeant Renardo Schuler from the United States Marine Corps, Sergeant Gary Clark, and Corporal Philip Horn of the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department are here to represent Toys for Tots. Uh, toys for Tots is a program run by the United States Marine Corps Reserve, which donates toys to children whose <clears throat> parents cannot afford to buy them gifts for Christmas. On Saturday, October the 8th at 1 p.m. at Methodist University at Monarch Stadium, Toys for Tots Cumberland County is proud to sponsor a flag football contest called Super Bowl 2011. And the contestants in this uh, Super Bowl will be the Fayetteville Police Officers versus the Cumberland County Sheriff's Deputies. The entry fee is one new unwrapped toy of a or a $5 donation. What we'd like to do is encourage all of you who can to be a part of this special uh, outreach to the less fortunate uh, youngsters in our city and county. And if you need more information, we have these flyers available, and we will make these available uh, here in the city offices. But I want to encourage you to come out and support this great event. A great event. And I want to thank these, uh, these great Americans for coming forward and volunteering their time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Arp. Okay, Council will move to item 6.0, tonight's consent agenda. Motion to approve. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chris. Uh, with your permission, sir, I'd like to pull item 6.6 .6 okay. on the consent agenda for brief discussion. All right. Uh, any other changes? All right, Mr. Chris, we'll take that in the form of a motion to approve the consent with the exception of 6.6. .6. I so move. Second. Thank yes. you, Mr. Bates. Any discussion on that motion? Ask for your vote, please. Okay, that is unanimous, and we'll move now to item 6.6. .6. Mr. Eyman, can you help us with this one, sir? <clears throat> Good evening, Council. Uh, item item 6.6 .6 is a uh, um, contract award for the purchase of six automated side-loading refuse trucks for use uh, 
in our uh, environmental services department. Uh, this item was budgeted during the year and is a cost efficiency item as well as uh, a long-term savings for the city. Um, the bids have been, the RFP has been prepared. Uh, they've been advertised, properly advertised, and bids have now been received, and this action would award the cost. <coughs> Happy to answer any questions if you have them. Okay, Mr. Chris. Mr. Diamond, uh, the question one of two is, uh, in so much as we understand that we are taking a review with the possibility of privatizing some part of, uh, if not all, of environmental services, uh, the question is, are we being premature then in ordering these trucks, uh, spending in excess of $1 million, uh, prior to uh, the recommendations of the study on privatization? Well, we're, we're not under do, undergoing a study for privatization. We have a, uh, a request for proposals on the street right now mm -hmm. uh, soliciting contractors to submit proposals. Uh, that study would uh, not study. That proposal would include the collection of basically one quarter of the residential properties in the city or 15,000 properties. That still leaves us with obviously uh, 45,000 properties to collect the solid waste uh, from those properties. And um, these trucks are needed and we project they will be needed. We don't think it's wise to uh, bite mm -hmm. off more than probably a quarter of the city at a time with a new contract until um, we have an opportunity to work with this first contract for a while. If things work uh, well, then, then I think we would uh, certainly look to the council to uh, begin to continue to uh, progress in that direction. Uh, but again, I wouldn't expect that it would take, um, that it would happen so quickly that these trucks, again, with a short lifespan of about seven years, uh, if the, I, I wouldn't expect that we would uh, be in a position where we were going to end up with a, a lot of trucks sitting around that we don't need. I, I am understanding that uh, we have some trucks that are in such condition now that we need to replace them. And if we do approve this uh, tonight, when would we see these new vehicles? Well, we have some on, coming on right now within the next two months, and then these vehicles probably would not uh, come on board for about six months. It takes a while to... Uh, get them constructed and uh, built and delivered about six months from the time the award of the contract. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right. Other <clears throat> questions? Mr. Harp. Very briefly, if I may. Uh, Mr. Ryman, I understand. So the life cycle of, uh, of these new garbage trucks will be about seven years? Yes, I believe that's the, the current trucks anyhow. I believe the, uh, the new ones are also projected to have a similar life cycle. And, and currently, we have a fleet of 22 trucks, of which one-third or seven, basically one-third, are spares that we use to rotate in when these trucks are uh, non-operational? That's correct. And so that, non, that, that spare number would decrease based on the, these new trucks coming into the fleet. Uh, that's, that's the current plan. Yes, but the, the, if the council moves towards privatization, that would not occur. At the earliest would be July 1st. July 1st. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mm -hmm. Bates? Yes, sir. Mr. Iman, if, <clears throat> if this is approved tonight, um, we actually coming in about $68,000 less than what was budgeted. So that 68000 it's still in there, but it would actually go back into the general fund that could be used to help clean up the city or bulky items and that kind of stuff? Uh, it stays in the environmental services fund. And, uh, until the end of the fiscal year and then uh, if it would remain there if it's not spent on another issue that comes up or an emergency then it would go back to the general fund and and potentially could be reallocated reappropriated by council for um, a variety of uses well if it stays in the environmental fund then those are the ones that are responsible for picking up the bulky items and tree limbs and that kind of stuff yes that's correct okay thank you any other questions? Okay, is there a motion from council? Mr. Bates? Motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion second. and a second by Mr. Chris. Any other discussion on the motion? May I ask your vote, please? 
Okay, that motion carries. Those in favor, Mr. Chris, Mr. Bates, Ms. Applewhite, Mr. Hurst, Mr. Shivani, Mr. Hare, Ms. Davey, Mr. Massey, Mr. Moan, in opposition, Mr. Arp. Okay, Council, we'll move now to our first public hearing. Let me give the rules for the public hearing. First of all, each side will have a total of 15 minutes to present your position, whether you are for or against. <coughs> Individual speakers will have one time to speak. Will be limited to three minutes each unless by previous arrangement a single spokesman is designated, in which case a spokesman may use the entire 15 minutes. When you hear the beep and see the light located on the podium change from green to yellow, that means there's approximately 30 seconds left of the three minutes. When you hear the beep, see the timer located on the podium blink and change from yellow to red, that means the full three minutes has expired. We ask that when your name is called, come to the podium and state your name and address clearly so we can make note of it for the record. <clears throat> and we'll begin tonight with item 7.1. Mr. Nash. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. <clears throat> this first public hearing tonight is regarding the uh, City of Fayetteville Hazard Mitigation Plan. I'll be giving you an overview of the process that's gone on recently about this, and then you will have your public hearing. <clears throat> um, the original um, hazard mitigation plan for Cumberland County uh, was done about five or six years ago, and this was a document. It's over 500 pages long. Uh, it was a five-year document, um, and it um, needed to be updated again. And the city of Fayetteville had worked with all the other jurisdictions in this county on the original plan and elected again to work with all the other units of local government in updating it. The updated plan that this hearing tonight is about is in this document. Came in at about the same length, over 500 pages. Um, the work on the update began in May of 2010. Uh, most of the research and uh, work for the city's efforts were completed in September 2010. It was then submitted to FEMA and the state. Um, it was approved by um, the state on April the 4th, 2011. We're now in the update process. All local government units in Cumberland County are considering whether to um, adopt the updated version of this plan. Uh, I believe you're the last unit to have your hearing and consider adoption tonight. Just a little bit of terminology because it is called a hazard mitigation plan. I uh, just want to clarify that it's about natural hazards. These are occurrences or events that are part of the world, the natural world, uh, that we cannot control. Uh, they're inevitable. They're very destructive. But when it happens to just the natural world, um, the natural world has a tendency to be able to recuperate pretty well. Say floods or hurricanes are good examples. Uh, disasters refer to the fact that um, human activity often has settled or taken place in the path of these forces of nature. And so there's often a um, heavy damage when a hurricane comes in on a beach area that's been heavily occupied by people or when a river rises out of its banks and floods the area where people have decided to live or work. Um, The problem is that people have chosen to often live and work in these vulnerable areas. The focus is on keeping these natural hazards from becoming disasters. Um, the focus in all this has not been anything about terrorism or man-made disasters, but rather natural disasters. And there's a couple definitions there for you, but on what we mean by hazard mitigation, it basically means reducing some of the adverse consequences of these hazards. Um, FEMA has its own definition. Any sustained action taken to reduce long-term risk to human life and property from natural hazards. And just some examples of that, um, restricting new development in vulnerable sections of the community and making existing development uh, in hazard prone areas safer. A couple of benefits of having an approved hazard mitigation plan are that it makes the local government eligible to receive disaster funds 
should uh, an event happen in the area. And it helps the staff and then the elected officials also identify actions that might help keep future hazards from becoming disasters. So keeping hazards from becoming disasters is the key. Um, in the work we did here in Cumberland County, 11 hazards were originally identified. You see them listed. Hurricanes, tornadoes, thunderstorms, droughts, severe winter storms, extreme heat, wildfires, flooding, earthquakes, and volcanoes and tsunamis were in the original plan. We were given permission to not address those this time. For the most part, most of our efforts have really been about the hazard of flooding. Um, that's the hazard that has mostly impacted this area. And here's a couple of pictures of how Fayetteville has been flooded in the past. The flood of 1945, looking west along Person Street. You can see the market house there in the middle, way down the road. And then this one's a little closer up. This is almost at Liberty Point, again from the flood of 45. The first photo was courtesy of the Fayetteville Observer. The second one was provided by Jim Greathouse and Bruce Dahls of our historic properties section. Um, just some highlights of what we d updated here. We identified, updated the hazard occurrences here through June of 2010. Please note that this does not include any data on the uh, tornadoes that struck this area in April 2011. The work had already been completed and was in review right then, getting approved right when the tornadoes hit. It involved updating or um, reviewing the strategies, the actions. There were 13 city actions. Um, most of our work was in the vulnerability assessment. And the reasons we had to spend a lot of work there were that the city has grown a lot through annexation. Uh, we have a new town now in Cumberland County, Eastover, uh, that had to be added in as a new section of the report. There's been a lot of new construction. Um, we received new flood maps from the state and um, the 2010 revaluation provided new tax values to use in our work. Just a little bit of information on what we found this time, that our number of buildings in Fayetteville increased from about 47,000 to 60, almost 69,000, and none of these numbers include anything in Fort Bragg, even though part of Fort Bragg is now inside Fayetteville. But our percentage of buildings in the flood hazard area went down from 14% to about 5%. Obviously, the city numbers went up because of just the growth the cities have had and the new development. The percentage decreased because of change in procedures we used. We had new flood maps. They were more accurate. Um, and we had a different procedure last time, which tended to capture more buildings as being vulnerable. There were 13 mitigation actions, um, <clears throat> just one or two examples here. For Fayetteville, one was to modify flood, our flood damage prevention ordinance. Um, it was recommended that we raise the um, lowest floor elevation to one foot above the base floor elevation. Um, actually, the change made in January of seven was that there would be a two foot um, distance above the base floor elevation required. And that's been noted in the update. Um, we're now in the kind of review and adoption process. Our fire and emergency management department took another close look at this recently and questioned some of the numbers in there about the fire department. I've talked to that person, explained that, and I think we can come to agreement on the numbers as they are now. Uh, it's been reviewed by your planning commission on August 16th and again on September 20th. Um, the planning commission noted a few things about perhaps the value of the sewage treatment facility being too low. Um, they had some questions about the projection of the value of critical facilities. Um, they were also concerned about whether this included information on tornadoes, and of course it didn't. At the 20, September 20th Planning Commission meeting, they did have a public hearing. It was well advertised. No one spoke. Um, the commission did go on record as approving that you um, consider approving the plan. They did have two recommendations to you that um, perhaps PwC focus on um, putting the existing overhead utility wires underground as time and resources permit. That would be very costly to do. 
but that is a way that um, electrical outages could be prevented uh, in the event of heavy wind storms or hurricanes in the future, tornadoes. They also commit, uh, recommended that perhaps the city give um, consideration to hiring a grant writer uh, that perhaps could apply for disaster mitigation grant money. Tonight is the night of your hearing. You'll consider whether to adopt it. Uh, if it's adopted, the mayor will sign the resolutions. They'll be sent over to the county, sent into FEMA and the state, and finally it will be approved for another five years. So the recommendation coming from Planning Commission and staff is that you do adopt the City of Fayetteville Hazard Mitigation Plan as part of the overall Cumberland County plan. There's plenty more information, um, a lot of interesting information here, particularly on the hazards, how frequently they've occurred here since 1950. It's all back there in Appendix A of the report. You can go to this website and uh, see the entire report. <coughs> we did not attempt to copy it all for you. <coughs> so this is your public hearing, and it has been published two times in the Fable Observer. Any questions for Mr. Nash? Mr. Mullen? Thank you, Mr. Nash. Um, when, you, when you referenced the, um, the base flood elevation and the new standards being two feet above, are those off the new FEMA maps, you know, the, when you said their base uh, flood, not the 100-year flood? It's the, uh, the base, you know, actual... Uh, the, the base flood elevation data is embedded in the maps, which we have in GIS. So that'll tell you at any place along the creeks in the city right. what that elevation would be that does generate the 100-year flood. Okay. And uh, the recommendation in the original plan was that any new construction going into an area that would be impacted by that be raised so that its lower floor level would be one foot above. But the city actually went a little bit further than that in 2007 to two feet. Mr. Chris? Uh, Mr. Nash, you... Who did you say was recommending the grant writer? Planning Commission. How did we handle the grant request for the April 16th disaster? Who did those, Mr. Diamond? Well, that's been handled through your emergency management department and I believe the city manager's office. And I'll defer to did anyone. Did we find else. that that approach was insufficient or No, not, not at all. Uh, Chief Nichols led the, the effort, uh, but uh, we also uh, hired... Um, a temporary employee at the time that had experience in emergency management. We had two staff people also in the position of emergency management personnel. And uh, we, we were very uh, thorough in working through the process. Of course, we had a leg up on the, on the rest of the, the uh, m uh, many other municipalities, I should say, because we had Ash Britt there and their uh, experience, uh, and it, it really helped a lot in the process as well. So, you no, know, it was uh, the record keeping and the uh, report filing has been timely and it's been uh, almost e exclusively accepted by FEMA and reimbursed. And then my final question is, if we hire a grant writer and we don't have any significant hazards, what will the grant writer do? Well, uh, I think the idea was from the Planning Commission that there are hazard mitigation grants out there that would perhaps help purchase properties that are in vulnerable this locations. Isn't a, this isn't the same. This isn't in response to right. a tragedy. Right. This would be a grant writer, like yeah, schools had grant writer, that you look for funds to help strengthen your proactive part of your plan, not just uh, the reactive part. So right. Thank you. Not grants and the extent that you're well, looking when, the, when it happens. That's what I'm trying to reconcile. Why are we tying the grant writer to the hazardous mitigation? Is that, that wouldn't be exclusively what the grant writer is doing. Is that what you're saying? Well, I guess potentially they could find funding opportunities for proactive things that we might do that would mitigate if we were to have a disaster. Okay. I guess that would, yes, sir. as an example, kind of like putting the power lines, you know, it's something you do early. Get a head start. Gets a head start. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nash. Anything else for Mr. Nash? <coughs> All right. Thank you, sir. We'll uh, open the public hearing if you'll stand by for any additional questions. Ma'am? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, we have no speakers on this item this evening. All right, ma'am. Thank you so much. We'll close the public hearing. And uh, any additional questions for Mr. Nash? Okay, we'll entertain a motion. Mr. Bates? Uh, motion to adopt. Okay. Second. Uh, second by Mr. Chris. Motion to adopt. We're on the roll here. Uh, any discussion on the motion? 
Let me ask for your vote, please. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nash. This is Nash. Okay, we'll move now to 7.2, uh, consider a petition requesting annexation uh, submitted by Methodist University. Mr. Nash. Change files here just a minute. Okay, this one is, uh, the, this slideshow is all three of the annexation public hearings coming up, and they are in this portrait orientation. I hope that doesn't throw you off, but it's because of the map layout we used. Tonight you have three annexation public hearings. The first one is the petition received from Methodist University for the Metacroft Drive, Riverdale Drive property. Um, this property and the other one are both between Ramsey Street on the west and the Cape Fear River on the east. Um, this particular property here is 28.25 acres. Let's get to a map of it real quick. Uh, the boundary of it is shown here on a dash yellow line. Uh, this is showing the aerial photography in the area from 2008, I believe. Um, Metacroft Drive is coming from the west on Ramsey, off of Ramsey Street. Uh, Riverdale is running on the southern edge of the area. Uh, the golf course, uh, fairways and so forth of Methodist College are east of the area. And an apartment complex known as Tartan Place is just north of it. The bright green area running through this area, meandering throughout, is the Cape Fear River Trail. Um, the reason this petition was submitted is I believe that it's related to a sidewalk construction project now going going on on Ramsey Street. Um, the existing land use in this area is mostly vacant, but there are two lakes and several storage buildings. We've verified that with Mr. Clayton at Methodist, uh, and, the, and the trail does pass through the area. No housing units or population. Um, some of the issues are that it is sufficient. We've checked the ownership. Methodist is the owner of the property. Um, we haven't, this has really been on a fast track and it has not been through a formal review by our city departments. Uh, we're just trusting that the impact is so minimal that uh, it shouldn't have caused them any trouble. We've told them about it, but we didn't ask, give them too much time to react. There were two lakes and the small storage buildings that would perhaps generate some demand for service. And the trail, of course, going through the property. Um, Mr. Bates asked at a recent agenda briefing meeting about the Kafer River Trail and the status of uh, its um, being on top of Methodist College property. We checked, according to Jerry Dietzen, who was involved in, I believe, helping this happen years ago, uh, there are recorded easements on top of the Methodist College property. And the city paid sixty to $65,000 for those easement rights. Um, if you choose to go through with this, then we're recommending you make it effective tonight. Um, should be neutral budget impacts on this area. Uh, this property is exempt from taxes. No cost projections have been done on it. Uh, the staff does recommend adopt it effective this evening, September 26. Mr. Diamond, do you have some additional information, sir? Yes, some clarification. These, these are the enclaves, if you'll recall back when we looked at all the enclaves or the donut holes in the city, these two properties are both uh, donut holes in the city. Uh, as, as Mr. Nash said, there's no development on the properties. Uh, there's no harm to the university because they would not pay taxes. Uh, I had a discussion with President Hancock, and he took it to his board, and uh, he did it. Uh, he asked for the annexation basically because we want to see the map filled in, and it was, uh, again, no harm for the university. And we're working very cooperatively with the university, and this is just another another example of that. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chris, you have a question? Mr. Nash, I want to hear it in plain English for our audience. This action will in no way restrict our citizens from crossing that property used in the River Trail. Is that correct? I don't see how it could. Okay. No. Just want to make sure. So. All right. Any other uh, questions? Okay, ma'am, we'll open the public hearing. 
Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, we have no speakers on this item this okay. evening. Thank you, ma'am. We'll close the public hearing. Any additional questions for Mr. Nance? Mr. Bates? I'd like to make a motion to adopt the annexation ordinance with effective date of September 26, 2011. Right. Mr. Chris? Sorry. I think Mr. Hurst got you on that one, sir. Okay, we have a motion and an appropriate second on the floor. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, let me ask for your vote, please. That's unanimous. Thank you. We'll move now to item 7.3, Longview <coughs> Drive. The second property from Methodist University is referred to as the Longview Drive Extension property. Go to a map of it real quick. Again, it's shown by the dash yellow line. Um, aerial photography is there. Um, the bright blue area represents the Cape Fear River. Uh, that's been color enhanced, not normally that blue. Um, this is, uh, you get to it off of Longview Drive Extension. That's just the best way to put it. Um, there's about 37 acres in there. Um, again, it's related to the uh, working with Methodist on some projects and they're helping us out. Um, the only thing that I know of that passes through the area or that is anything close to being developed is the Longview Drive extension running through it. And it's really just a trail at this point leading to one house. There are no homes or population in this area. Um, the petition is sufficient. The services should be okay. Um, this will create a, several new enclave areas um, there are some homes along Meth Longview Drive Extension, and I'm not sure I had a, one would be there, and several more on these lots. This property will wrap behind them, creating a small enclave area there, and on the other three lots. It's recommended again uh, September 26, 2011, tonight if you go along with this. The budget impact, um, slightly positive. I'm sure Mr. Iman is not aware, but in the tax records, this one actually has a little bit of value right now. Perhaps the university has not applied for an exemption on it. Uh, based on that value, it works out to about um, $278 um, property tax revenue to the city, and that would be $1,766 carried out for five years. Now, it's very likely that perhaps the school will try to get that exempted, in which case that revenue would not continue on in the future. And the staff recommendation is um, that you adopt the ordinance effective September 26. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Mr. Nash? Mr. McGill, we'll open the public hearing. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, we have no speakers on this item this evening. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Any additional questions? Mr. Bates? Sir, um, adopt the, recommend adopt the ordinance with effective date of 26 <coughs> September 2011. Second. Uh, Mr. Hare got you, I think, sir. A <laughs> contest did, going on I here. did it the right way. I pushed my button. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have a, a motion and an appropriate second. Any discussion on the motion? May I ask for your vote, please? That motion uh, carries. Those in favor, Mr. Chris, Mr. Bates, Ms. Applewhite, Mr. <coughs> Hurst, Mr. Shivani, Mr. Hare, Ms. Davey, Mr. Arp, Mr. Moan, in opposition, Mr. Massey. Okay, we'll move now to item 7.4, uh, Baywood Point subdivision. Mr. Nash. <coughs> um, didn't we have three of these on Wednesday? For Methodist? Two. There was two on Wednesday and then this one? Okay, I, I'm sorry. I thought we had three from Methodist. I was wondering what happened to the... Okay. This one is regarding the Baywood Point subdivision. Um, this is a satellite request for annexation. You might remember that in July you had this on your agenda, but it was pulled on July the 25th because it was determined at that time that the petition was not sufficient. A new petition has been received, I believe, on September 12th, and um, utilities are now on hold pending the outcome of all this. Let's go to a map. This um, is on the east side of the city. There's a label pointing to it. I hope you can see that. 
we're talking about right here. And um, there's an existing satellite of the city nearby. This, it's located in an area referred to as Vander, the Vander community, which is unincorporated. 16.7 um, acres are in the area requested for annexation. This one zoomed in a little closer, allowing you to see some more detail. Uh, in this particular slide, um, the area of Baywood Point is shaded in green. Um, it's nestled up against the North Carolina 24 Highway, which is almost like an interstate highway right there. Uh, Baywood Road crosses NC 24, and this property is in the southwestern quadrant of that um, intersection. Um, the nearby satellite area, referred <coughs> to as Cape Fear Crossing, is shown a little to the southwest at Baywood Point, and it's on Clinton Road. And this is zoomed in almost on top of the property, just showing an outline of the boundaries. Why was this petition submitted? Uh, it's required by current city policy. <coughs> if a property is within the city of Fayetteville's MIA area, that is municipal influence area, uh, and if PWC water and sewer are requested, the owner must submit an annexation petition. That's the way I understand the policy reading right now. Um, this map shows you the MIA area in orange. Um, the Baywood Point area is in the turquoise there. Um, immediately to the east is a dark green area, which is represent represents the Stedman MIA area, protruding to the west from Stedman, which is off the edge of the map. Um, the map also shows you the existing city in yellow over to the far left and the little satellite we've already talked about. Um, the purple area at the top is the town of Eastover. The blue area, it's actually in white, but it's bounded by a blue area, is one of the sewer service areas that are designated on the MIA map. And finally, the light green area is the town of Eastover's MIA area up in the upper right corner of this map. Um, the names of the petitioners are in the material that I believe you received, but essentially they're Baywood Point LLC, Mr. Wesley Meredith being a member manager, Savvy Homes located in Raleigh, two individuals we've received signatures on from, from that LLC is Mr. Degree and Mr. Aiken. Uh, and then we have petitions from several um, either already uh, current owners of <coughs> small lots in the area, Mr. Pierre-Andre Bellaris, who owns Lot 7. Uh, Ms. Wanda uh, DeJesu Fernandez, who owns Lot 8. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Harris, who own Lot 30. Um, the developers submitted two more names on the petition, noting them as pending, which I believe means that they're going to probably close on their lots uh, sometime soon. It does not appear they're currently the owners. Just some more information about the area. It's being developed as a residential subdivision with single-family detached houses. There are 30 lots. Uh, it appears that 11 of them are now developed. 19 do not appear to be yet developed. Um, number of housing units, 11 single-family units. Uh, as of last week, or September 15th, I believe, uh, there were three occupied and eight vacant. This map shows you the development status of those lots back in the middle of July, prior to your first um, time you were going to look at this. <coughs> in this particular map, the green represents the undeveloped lots. The purple represents the lots that were then being developed with homes. The yellow represented the homes that had completed housing units in July. Now we go to sep September 15th status. And all of the homes that were under construction are now completed, shown there in yellow. Uh, the remaining lots had not had any construction yet started on September 15th. This shows the ownership. Uh, Ms. DeJesu Fernando's lot is number eight there in purple. Mr. Bellarice is number seven in blue. And the Harrises have the brown shaded one, uh, number 30. The yellow ones are owned by uh, Savvy Homes, and the green areas are owned by uh, Baywood Point LLC. A little bit of demographics about the area, uh, based on it having three occupied housing units, we're just going to estimate there were seven people there using citywide averages. Uh, when the area is completely developed, 
it should have about 75 people. Um, the current streets for the subdivision have recently been built and no additional streets are expected. This is the sheet that's in your packet. It's a little too small to read from. Some of the issues are that the sufficiency has been verified as of this afternoon and we feel confident that the petition is okay, that is it's valid or sufficient. Uh, your services were reviewed back in uh, the prior version of this process and we had a little meeting in July about it. Uh, departments haven't given me any new information to say that anything's changed. Um, the issue of when should it be effective should you annex it uh, comes up and we're recommending on this one December 31st 2011. Um, that is because there are some people living in the area. You got an election coming up. There's no way these people would be um, pre-cleared to vote in your city elections in time for the primary and the general election in November. So the simplest thing to do is postpone the effective date until December 31. Um, the impact of the current hold on PWC services um, from the School of Government, they've written that, um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Um, it's assumed that should you annex this area that all that will be resolved with your action. Um, the impact of the future sale of property after the ordinance is adopted, should you adopt it tonight. Uh, according to the School of Government experts on this, uh, any sale of property after the ordinance is adopted but before the effective date occurs is immaterial, doesn't make it invalid. It stays valid as long as it's valid as of the time you take your action. Um, the, an interesting issue is the impact on the homeowners of uh, the additional taxes and fees. A little bit of information on there. Um, an Excel spreadsheet was prepared. We assume that the homes in that area would be valued at $200,000. Automobiles would be worth at least 20,000. That's probably a low ball figure. That home value is right at the target point for Baywood Point according to the signs out in the area. We're assuming 5,000 gallons of water per month. Um, we're assuming that local taxes are deductible in federal income tax form. So based on all those assumptions, and if we plug in the figure for 99,000, a person with an income of $99,950, uh, and assume that they're filing married, um, status is married, filing jointly, their total taxes and fees on an annual basis would go up by $105. We feel like that information might take some of the fear out of what people might have been afraid of on this area. Um, the reason for that figure is that it's easy to look up in the income tax booklet. You just go straight to the table that is valid for anybody with an income under $100,000 and look it up. Mm. The budget impact on the city should be positive. Um, it's been projected that over five fiscal years, there could be as much as $196,000 uh, revenue from the annexing this area. That should offset any cost. A um, little bit of information on those revenue projections over five years. It assumes that all 30 houses would be built by the end of FY 13-14, that your current tax rate stays the same. Um, the current revenue factors, say, of um, sales tax being based on about $150 per capita, assume that stays the same in the future. <coughs> you put all those things into a spreadsheet and you come up with perhaps a revenue of $196,000. It's broken out there for you with about $90,000 being ad valorem tax revenue. The rest being based on population-based things. Um, some of your cost would be $1,560 for rollout carts to the area. That'd be one time only. Uh, about $7,200 a year for um, the contracting cost of uh, contracting this out for garbage collection um, based on $240 per year. Uh, Mr. Dietzen, I believe, reported that um, he would probably also enter into a contract for that other area nearby if this area is annexed and contract for both of them. But this cost here is attributed only to the Baywood Point annexation. And finally, the fire department reported about $1,000 per year in contract cost for fire protection with the Vander Fire Department. Um, 
the police department reported that there would be some cost for um, time and gas to get out there to serve the area. We didn't get any cost projections from them. But in light of all that, it does look like it would be a positive um, <coughs> annexation from the standpoint of fiscal impact. Uh, staff, again, recommends adoption effective December 31. Thank you, sir. We've got a couple of questions. Mr. Crisp. Uh, Mr. Nash, your projection of 196000 over five years breaks down to 39200 a year. Can we service that development for 39200 or are we coming out in the red? Well, I mean, we're talking fire and service, police, for, for and we're going to gain, by your projection, 39200 Can we do it for that? Well, the cost <coughs> here um, indicates um, $7,200 a year for garbage pickup service. And that's assuming all 30 homes have been built and are getting the service. Uh, $1,000 a year for fire protection. I guess the unknown is the cost of police protection. And uh, we don't, I don't think we got any other cost figures in. I apologize if we've missed something. Perhaps the limb pickup um, weren't factored in here for sanitation. Um, these are city operating department costs that we did receive. Do you have anything else, Mr. Chris? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Nay. Thank you, Mr. Nash. The, um, the homes that are already built and occupied, are they currently tied in and receiving PwC water and sewer? I mean, so they are actively using those services. Yes, sir. Okay, and I saw it was progress energy for the electric. Okay, and then um, if we contract with the Vander Fire Department, would the... Uh, would those homes out there receive the same ISO rating on their insurance as, as we enjoy here in the um, contiguous part of Fayetteville versus the satellite portion? Do, do you know that off the top of your head if well, Vander I, Fire Department has the same ratings? I think the ISO rating is for the whole city, and they, they've just gone through a <coughs> process to get all that, I believe, verified for a while. Right. Um, they did point out that they were perhaps a little, you know, they weren't concerned about it, but they did say that it could impact that. That's back when they were being reviewed for, I think, ISO, mm -hmm. or it might have been accreditation in the middle of the summer. Right. Uh, Mr. Did you, have, did you have something, Ms. McDonald? I did want to also point out, um, I believe Mr. Nash is correct on the ISO, but additionally, when we contract with uh, the fire departments, we do enter into a contract which, provi which requires that they respond uh, with the same um, number of personnel and meet the time uh, limit as the average time limit within the regular uh, contiguous portion of the city. Okay. Yeah, because I believe right now uh, our fire department has three trucks respond. I was at the fire this week, and that's pretty standard. Three trucks from three different company, uh, three different um, engine companies. Um, I'm just wondering if Vander has that same capacity. You know, that might drain their whole fire department for one call uh, just just curious mr Harp, do you have a question sir yeah i do <clears throat> and mr nash the the property owners that you showed listed there were two pending but all of the property owners that were listed they're in favor of this annexation is that correct they signed the petitions okay i mean a lot of times we get questioned about i just want to make sure that this they're 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 asking for this petition Yes, sir. We do have signatures. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. We'll open the uh, public hearing, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, members of the City Council, we have no speakers on this item this All evening. All right. Thank you, Mr. McGill. We'll close the public hearing and entertain any additional questions or a motion. Mr. Harp. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would move that we approve the proposed annexation as uh, recommended by the City staff. Oh, probably need to be specific on that effective date. Uh, uh, effective 31 December 2011. Okay, is there a second to Mr. I had a question. Okay, uh, Once I have a motion. first and appropriate second, and now question, Mr. Moon. Yes, this might be for um, Mr. Iman or the city attorney. Um, if we do not go through with this annexation and uh, understanding PwC's charter where they can they can expand PwC sewer and water anywhere within the county without council's approval by the charter. You know, I know we have agreements. 
if this annexation, voluntary annexation, does not go through, can the remainder of the property still receive PwC sewer and water or with a direct agreement between PwC without going through the council? Um, we're currently working on a revision to uh, policy 150.2 uh, regarding this exact uh, issue at, at the direction <coughs> of the city council. Currently, the uh, policy states that the in order to receive uh, Fayetteville utilities in terms of water and sewer, uh, that uh, a petition for annexation must be received and acted on by council. Um, that does not say that it has to be approved by council. Under the well, I think current the, wording. That's correct, under the current current language. But, the, but on the work session, uh, October 3rd, we're going to have a revised policy for council consideration. Any other questions? Okay, let me ask for your vote on the motion, please. That motion carries. Those in favor, Mr. Bates, Ms. Applewhite, Mr. Hurst, Mr. Shivani, Mr. Hare, Ms. Davey, Mr. Arp, and Mr. Massey. In opposition, Mr. Crisp and Mr. Mullen. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nash. That's the end of our public <coughs> hearings. We'll now new move to item 8.1, which concerns uninhabitable structures demolition. Mr. Swanson's with us this evening. Sorry, I didn't bring my glasses with me. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable Mayor and City Council, before you this evening is a staff request for adoption for demolition ordinances for three buildings determined to be dangerous or blight. Staff has complied with all statutory requirements in determining that these buildings are dangerous or blight. All statutory process and service requirements relating to the issuance of notices, notices and to the respective property owners has been met. <clears throat> None of the properties were eligible for the city's acquisition demolition program, and a letter was of the agenda item for this meeting was mailed out to each of the property owners. First property we have here is uh, 516 Link. And it's uh, located between Grove and Pearson Street. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we We've determined that it's, that it's a blighted building. It's not a historical property. It's a vacant house in a residential zone. The utilities were disconnected as of September 2009. Uh, this one here, we've had, in the last two years, 166 calls for 9-11 service and 18 code violations. We have $1,000. $543.66 of city assessments for lot cleanings and boarding of the, of the building. There's $505.92 in outstanding taxes, and the low bid for the demolition cost was $1,300. And this picture here is actually the front of this uh, structure. That what you see there used to be an overhang for the porch. It's completely gone. Uh, we went out to inspect it. We took the photographs. The uh, building was open. <coughs> side door. <coughs> this is a picture of the inside. This kitchen. The next property is uh, 806 Eugene Street. And that's located uh, in Borden Heights off of uh, Cumberland Road. Uh, this structure is a dangerous building. It uh, <coughs> doesn't have any historical <coughs> value. It's a vacant house in a residential zone. Utilities were disconnected as of uh, February 2009. In the last two years, there's been three calls for 9-11 service and three code violations. 
We have $494.48 in outstanding assessments for lot cleaning. There's no outstanding taxes, and the low bid for demolition is $3,400. This is a picture of the front of the uh, house. You can see this is uh, part of the uh, damage to the roof. Uh, this photograph here shows there's a hole that goes right through the roof from the inside. And this is the, some damage to the floor from the, that hole in the roof where it's rained and it's caused the floor to buckle up. And this picture right here is actually, you can stand inside and just look right up through the roof. Uh, the last property is uh, 1639 Rudolph Street. And that's located, uh, it's, it's close to E.E. E. Smith High School. Uh, this is a dangerous building, <coughs> fire damaged uh, in April, on April 22nd, uh, 2011. It's not a historical property. Uh, it was a vacant house when it was uh, fire, when it received the fire damage. Uh, it's a residential zone. The utilities were uh, disconnected in September of 2009. Last two years, it was 11 calls for 9-11 service and we had four code violations. There's uh, $1,050.39 in city assessment for lot cleanings and securing of the building. There is, there, there is uh, $1,528.50 uh, $1 of outstanding taxes, and the low bid for demolition cost in this, this house is uh, $2,900. This photograph of the front of the house. This is the rear. And this uh, reflects the fire damage on the inside of the house. And that concludes our presentation and staff's available for any questions. Okay, we have any questions for Mr. Swanson? No, sir. If not, is there a motion? Mr. Davey? I'd like to make a motion to uh, adopt the ordinances and then demolish the, sub, um, the structures, which is at... Um, 806 Eugene Street, 516 Link Street, and 1639 Rudolph Street. All right. Second. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Mr. Bates, thank you. Any discussion of the motion? Let me ask for your vote, please. That is unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Thank you for being here, sir. 8.2, consideration of a planned neighborhood district for Bingham Drive. Mr. Harmon. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. <clears throat> uh, before you tonight, we do have a detailed development plan for a planned neighborhood district. Uh, the name of this uh, proposed development is the Reserve at Bingham. <clears throat> uh, the property is located on the southwest, southeast side a Bingham Drive across from Lake Ridge Drive uh, actually borders on the uh, city limits uh, in that area. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is a PND uh, for a detailed development plan and currently is about 55.9 acres. Uh, just as a reminder, in the PND uh, plan approval process, uh, it is a two step process. Uh, requiring first a general plan approval, uh, which went through the Planning Commission in January and then was approved by the City Council in February of this year. Uh, once that is approved, then the developer has a two-year window to come back with the detailed uh, development plan. Uh, this developer has come back uh, already with this one. Uh, it has gone before the Planning Commission. Uh, they've recommended approval. And tonight is uh, up for your consideration. Uh, this gives you an idea of where the property is located out on Bingham Drive. Uh, just to give you a little idea of the area. Uh, this was a rezoning about a year and a half ago where there's a new food line. Uh, <clears throat> we've also had a cell tower here at this church uh, within the last six, six to 12 months. Um, and then, as I said before, uh, the southern part of this uh, proposed development is the city limits uh, with the county. <clears throat> Cur 
currently uh, the property is undeveloped. Uh, there are some, as I said, the commercial area here where the food line is, a couple of churches, uh, some smaller commercial areas here to the north, a couple of uh, auto paint body shops, and then this longer one being a mini storage. <clears throat> And then the yellow uh, being uh, low density residential, uh, mainly around this project. Our land use plan has called for this area to be uh, low density residential. Uh, however, as I mentioned, when this was annexed into the city, it was already a PND or planned neighborhood district zoning, uh, which does require the site plan approval that's coming to you tonight. Uh, aerial photo just again to give you an idea of, of where this is, mainly wooded uh, property currently. Uh, you can see there is a uh, utility easement uh, coming through the middle of the property where there are no trees. Uh, other than that, uh, undeveloped at this point. Uh, hopefully you can see this okay. I think on y'all's monitors it's not coming too clear tonight. Um, hopefully it's a little clearer than the monitor beside of me. Um, but just a couple of features. Uh, the site plan I'll show you in just a moment. This was mainly to show you the connectivity to the uh, existing development here to the south. Uh, you have <clears throat> Bingham Drive here. Uh, we have painters, well we have actually Silver Bell coming off of Bingham Drive here. And this uh, development uh, painters mill will now connect into this new development uh, run north and then connect back into Bingham Drive so it'll not only give uh, this new development uh, two access points in and out but it'll also now give uh, this development here where painters mill and silver, silver bell are uh, two entrance ways in and out of their development which they have not had in the past <clears throat> I think this, uh, this map is in your packet, and I think it comes out a bit clearer on the monitor. Um, you can see here uh, from the entranceway off of Bingham, uh, the north entranceway here, uh, to the, north, to the uh, east side of it is where the multifamily uh, residential will be. Uh, then we have on the <clears throat> south side here their commercial area that they're proposing. Uh, then we have uh, single family residential here around this cul-de-sac and then this whole area uh, in here is also single family residential. Uh, then you have open space here which does connect into a larger open space area uh, connecting into a creek system uh, back off the map. And then open space uh, here as well where that power easement uh, comes through the property. <coughs> Uh, just as a, a rundown uh, and a reminder, the, under the PND, there is a, a percentage breakdown that has to occur uh, with the certain different types of development on the property. Uh, the commercial is, is under the PND is to be developed as C1P commercial. Uh, this one came in under the old ordinance, just as a reminder. Uh, there's 2.8 acres of commercial. Uh, around 11 acres of open space. I believe it's about eight acres that are required open space. Uh, then we've got, uh, <clears throat> as far as the R10 residential, we've got 25 acres of that, which will accommodate 75 single family uh, residential lots. And then the multifamily being about 15 acres, uh, which the developer is asking for 216 lots uh, or units proposed. Uh, they could have had as many as, as four more, 220 uh, allowed under the densities for that. Um, staff is known to the developer uh, during the, the first process and, it, and again through this process if, if council wants to go this way that uh, the possibility of a berm or more substantial fence and landscaping uh, may be needed along the public edge on the rear of the development. And I'll just back up real quick. And what, what that is talking about is this area through here where the, the single family residential 
uh, butts up against uh, Bingham Drive. The developer does show a, a fence through that area, but that being the public edge, uh, it may be good to have some better landscaping or something so it's not just a, a solid fence wall going through there. Uh, a TIA or traffic impact analysis will be required on the project and uh, the open space uh, we noted the first time should help connect uh, the natural corridors in that area and as I pointed out a moment ago it does. Uh, the Planning Commission and staff have recommended approval uh, of this detailed site plan. Uh, this is a reminder again this is not a public hearing tonight it's just a regular item there are uh, at least one representative of the uh, developer here if you have questions of them as well but uh, that's uh, are there any questions of staff at this point Mr. Chris has one sir Mr. Harmon are we assured that a light will be at that interest way or will that be determined following the TIA uh, I believe the TIA has already been done uh -huh. out there and that they are going to have to put a light at that intersection and I'll I'll defer just real quickly to the developer's engineer, if you don't mind, just to... And if we do put a light there, will it have a turn lane? But I'll let Mr. Jimmy Kaiser just, since he is the project engineer on this. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. Good to see you. Um, in reference to the question, we have completed a TIA. It's been submitted to both DOT and the city. And the recommendation of the TIA was to install a light there. The light's a phased uh, improvement based on the build-out of the development. Okay. So the single-family subdivision on its own does not dictate that the light be put in. But before we can complete uh, construction of the multifamily and the commercial, the light needs to be installed as part of the improvement. So we're anticipating that's probably a three to four year build out to get to that point. But as part of that work, there would be um, a reuse of the existing left turn lane on Bingham Drive onto Painter's Mill into the project. Mm -hmm. And there would be a right turn lane coming into Painter's Mill off Bingham Drive into the project. And there would also be a little bit of widening um, coming out of Lake Ridge on the other side to allow for a left turn with the light coming out of there and us to be able to get in traffic. We actually have a little piece of property over there that may be another project. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Bates? Yes, sir. Well, at the same time, we're talking um, the front entranceway, or not entranceway, but the front border. Um, I've seen some developments where they have the berm, you know, in, in the trees and the, in the wood there. Um, do y'all plan on doing that, or do we need, I don't know how we can, you know, say that's what we want to see in there. I, I've seen them, and I think they look pretty good that way. I mean, so I, I and it kind of, I guess it helps with the noise and stuff too, I guess. To an extent, yeah, this, the, there's a lot of topography on this piece of property, and in order to make it work, um, there'll have to be a lot of grading done. Um, from talking with the developers, they do intend to do some landscaping and a nice fence along Bingham Drive. Now, to how much of an extent they were planning on berming it, we really haven't discussed that yet just because we haven't gotten far enough along in the engineering plans to kind of see where the grades are going to end up. I think what's going to happen is if you ride by the project on Bingham Drive and look at it, what we'll end up doing is actually lowering the single family section of the site down some from the Bingham Drive grade so you won't necessarily get the full effect of the house um, that backs up to the road. So it may be something that a fence and adequate landscaping can, you know, buffer adequately. Mm -hmm. But at this point, I, I wouldn't want to say, yeah, we're wholeheartedly planning on putting a berm yet because we just haven't finished the grading plan yet. All right, thank you. And then, Mr. Harmon, um, we've talked about it before, and it's not a requirement, but have we approached the developers on um, an easement just large enough to put a bus stop in in five years, ten years, one year? You know, yeah. so that way when the time comes, the easement's already there, we can put a bus stop in. I don't believe in this case that we have. Hmm. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Mr. Chris. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the consideration of the planned neighborhood 
detailed development plan applicable to the location on the southeast side of Bingham Drive, across from Lake Ridge Drive, containing 56.22 acres, more or less, and me and the property of Edgar L. Manesh and wife and Robert C. Drehorn and wife. All right. We'll second the motion, Mr. I think Moore. we got that motion and uh, a second. Mr. Arp, uh, thank you for that second motion. Any discussion on the motion? May I ask you a vote, please? Go in peace, Mr. Kaiser. <laughs> my lights are messing up again. That was uh, unanimous. Ignore my red light. I'm hitting all kinds of, all my, all my buttons are falling off again. Is it unanimous? Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. Okay, we'll move now to item 8.3, <clears throat> a request that a sidewalk. Yeah. A request that a sidewalk not be required to be constructed with the city's MIA. It's not Miss Bryant? No. It, um, I figured it, instead of having all the staff report tonight, I'd stand in for one of them anyway. Um, so, Karen Hilton, good evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is, as noted, a MIA sidewalk waiver request. Uh, that's municipal influence area. It comes <clears> up when a project is going through the subdivision process in the county within the MIA area. It's located at 1171 South Eastern Boulevard. Um, a little bit of background, it is owned by uh, Mr. Harden. It involves 12.4 acres being split into two parcels. The front part will be the larger one, about eight acres, and the second, the remaining portion is um, the about four acres, 4.2. The front area is more the structure, as you'll see um, from some of the photos. The back part, uh, the county is asking, encouraging them to split off the outdoor storage area from this piece. Um, so that will be the portion that's being separated. The area for which the sidewalk would be required uh, would total about 500 feet. Uh, there's 480 across the front and then about a 20-foot access lane along the top edge of the property to the back portion. Of the site. If it were to be done under the city where we do have in lieu of payment, um, it would be about a $16,300 in lieu fee. The site, as you can see, is just south of the intersection of the MLK Boulevard and um, Southeastern Boulevard, shown in the hatched area. It is in an area that's currently zoned almost entirely industrial. Uh, as you'll see from the aerial, a lot of that area is not necessarily developed where it is. It is done as industrial development, and it's likely to stay this way for some time um, as a general use pattern. As you can see, there are essentially two portions to the site. The large, um, the front parcel and the large wooded section would be parcel number one. The rear portion would become parcel number two. Uh, this is uh, moving sort of northward toward downtown. Uh, you're Parcel is to the right, A and T um, trucking, and oops, wrong direction. A little bit farther down the road. Um, this is a service uh, road that it parallels uh, Eastern, so it is controlled entirely by DOT. That <coughs> is one of the issues. DOT on the service road will not allow the sidewalk um, individually. Where it would occur would have to be on the private property, and there is no sidewalk in the area. Consequently, as you continue to look at the pictures, the st staff considered that it is unlikely in the relatively near future, uh, with large parcels industrially used, that we're likely to see a fill-in over time on sidewalks. Uh, on the other hand, as you'll see on option number two, rather than completely um, waiving any requirement uh, to meet city standards or to help the city in future retrofitting that might occur. The recommendation is option number two, where you, we are recommending that we deny the waiver, i.e. they would, under normal circumstances, have to build the sidewalk. But with the condition that, in fact, they do not have to build the sidewalk, they would, however, um, be asked to provide the 10-foot easement on their property for future retrofitting as the area evolves. Um, so minimal cost at this point in time. It's unlikely to be connected to anything in the near future, or even reasonably foreseeable future, as the best option. As a reminder, uh, the county um, planning board is the one who makes the decisions. It, um, 
is a quasi-judicial process that they take up on October 18th, so the City will, uh, Planning Commission will probably have a representative there with any of your discussion and findings and uh, recommendation tonight. Any questions for Ms. Hilton, Mr. Bates? Ms. Hilton, um, so staff recommends denial with the condition that a 10-foot easement be re required located in coordination with city engineering. So we're saying we want that easement because sometime in the future the city will pay to put the sidewalk in. More than likely, or a multi-purpose um, trail or path um, could be at some point 10 years from now, could be a different kind of vehicular or pedestrian connection. But yes, wow. the city would undertake it at that point. I mean, if we're recommending, you know, give us the land and we'll do it later on, then I, I say that we have them do it now. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, uh, thank you. Okay. Other questions for Ms. Hilton? Okay. What's the, care for a motion? Yeah. Who's it? It's not in the city. Go ahead, Mr. Brown. I make a motion that we follow staff's recommendation that we uh, deny with the condition that um, they provide a 10-foot sidewalk easement for potential future development. Okay. Second of Mr. Mullen's motion? Second. Second. Okay, Mr. Chris, thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Ask for your vote, please. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hilton. Okay, Councilor, our last uh, item is uh, North Carolina League of Municipalities Annual League Business Meeting Voting Delegates. Mr. Iman. Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, the uh, uh, North Carolina League of Municipalities annual meeting <coughs> will be held uh, beginning Monday, October 24th, and I think running through the 26th. And uh, this item involves uh, um, the council uh, assigning one member of the council that will be participating in attending the conference to act as a voting delegate on behalf of the, uh, the uh, North Carolina League of Municipalities. Okay, council. We have a motion. Uh, the attendees, I believe, are Mr. Bates, Ms. Applewhite, Mr. Massey, and Mr. Shivani. Uh, we have a motion for uh, to appoint an official. Mr. Mr. Bates, sir. I have a motion for Mr. Hare to appoint Mr. Bates. Is there a second to that? Thank you, Mr. Massey. Any discussion on it? Ask for your vote. Can we modify that in acclamation? The substitute would be uh, Ms. Applewhite. Just, uh, just is that okay with everybody? Okay. Thank you so much. Meeting adjourned.